Welcome to Around the Empire. I'm your host, Joanne Leon. This is a fully independent podcast. Lend your support at rockfin.com slash around the empire, patreon.com slash around the empire, or paypal.me slash around the empire pod. Also, please like, share, and subscribe on the YouTube channel. Our guest today is Patrick McFarlane. In this age of the decline of the establishment mainstream media, the pundits and the usual China Hawk commentators aren't the only ones parroting the hostile and aggressive narratives toward China. A surprising number of independent media personalities with large followings are doing the same thing. Patrick takes note of some of the people and the places where this is happening, and he does deep dive research into the Uyghur genocide claims and counterclaims themselves, and takes a sober look at the evidence. Patrick McFarland is a practicing attorney in Wisconsin, a libertarian podcaster, and a contributor at the Libertarian Institute. We recorded this on April 16th, 2021. Patrick McFarland is here with us tonight. Hello, Patrick. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Hi, Joanne. I'm really glad to be here. Thanks for having me on. So if you don't mind, since it's the first time on this podcast, would you just take a couple minutes to introduce yourself? Yeah. So my name is Patrick McFarland. I'm a practicing attorney in Wisconsin. Uh, A few years ago during law school, I started a podcast and a website. The website is called libertyweekly.net. Uh, so you can find it there. But the, of course, the podcast is called the Liberty Weekly Podcast. And so I, I'm a libertarian. I'm a anarchist libertarian. I, I do believe that being anti-war is the most important issue. So I've been trying to educate myself a bit more on foreign policy, but mostly I cover libertarian legal theory, um, economics and, and the like. But I'm a contributor at Scott Horton's Libertarian Institute and um, I'm, I'm really glad I, I've been writing articles there and uh, it's been really awesome. It's been quite a journey for me. Yeah, that's a great group. I, I have some friends there, as you know. And when I watched your show on conflicts of interest with, um, with Kyle, I, I knew I wanted to talk to you, uh, come on the podcast and have a chat with you. So that's how this came about and also the topic is a really important topic uh, that you wrote about recently. And I'll link this article in the show notes. And the title of the article is Independent Media Parrots Questionable Uyghur Genocide Claims. Um, and, but Patrick digs into a few different really good areas. I think areas that we'd like to pull the thread on and know that, and I'll also link um, a couple of interviews that I've done on this topic, which both of the people are people you cite in your article, Gareth Porter and Peter Lee. And they both have different um, things to bring to the table. But I I like how you dug in even a little more into some of these things. And, you know, it seems to me you were just curious about the message that you saw coming across. Like we expect it from, well, you know, you you cite, Pompeo's parting shot uh, at China, you know, accusing, making a formal accusation of genocide, the Uyghurs. And, you know, we expect that from the mainstream media because, you know, the daily diet of uh, foreign policy related propaganda. But you dug into independent media, which is good because for a number of reasons, I you know, I worry about independent media. I, I am part of it. Uh, and I wonder, you know, if, if we're going astray in some cases, and it's also, it's sort of a prime territory right now for the people to whom propaganda is very important because they know that cable news is on the decline, uh, is not well-trusted. Mainstream media in general is not well-trusted. Uh, we know from things that I know anyway, think from things um, that I have seen written that podcasts are a new target where there are people saying they need to crack down on podcasts, that there are, you know, there's too much freedom to say what, what you want to say. Whereas YouTube, for example, is now has like a whole new phase. It goes through some kind of a check 
we know that it translates in real time, things like that. Uh, I mean, tran does a transcript in real time, things like that. And we've seen the crackdown. I mean, it's, it's just right in front of your face. So it would not surprise me if independent media, um, oh, one more thing I wanna cite is that the Time News article, the infamous Time News article about the 2020 election, they mentioned that they went, uh, they approached, um, what did they call them, micro-influencers or whatever. So they were looking for people and they, they emphasized that they were looking for people who had developed a relationship with their audience, which you know would translate to trust. So trust is that gold that they're looking for, that they need. I mean, it's gotta be crucial to propagandists, right? And to people who <clears throat> have an agenda. And we, I mean, it's, it's pretty clear that um, our government, uh, other entities, uh, to them, you know, this is it. This is maybe more important than ever to be able to put the messaging out that they want and to have an audience that believes them. So um, that's why I was particularly interested in the way that you dug into independent media about this. So just to frame it, you talk about, uh, you know, Pompeo's parting shot. And then you mention that instead of the expected Biden being sort of more sympathetic to China, uh, weaker on China, some, as some would put it, like that didn't happen. Blinken came in, God only knows why this guy is the Secretary of State to begin with. Um, but, you know, he, he basically continued with that narrative, the genocide narrative, and as you said, he doubled down on the targeted economic sanctions. So there's that. And that's not all that surprising because as we know, somehow war and foreign policy maintains this sort of even keel depending no matter who's in office. And if anybody does try to rock the boat, they get, if a president or another high level official does try to sort of stray, uh, there's a big price to pay. They go after them. They end up, we've seen presidents reverse their decisions. We've seen massive attacks in the media. I think one of the most startling examples most recently was when Trump uh, announced that he was just gonna withdraw the troops from Syria. There was a total and complete freak out. Lindsey Graham was a good person to watch on that. He ran out to every media outlet, every microphone he could find. He was talking about how they have to reset the table. We're going to reset the table. Almost like he was Trump's handler or something. And it was going to be his responsibility to, to turn that around. And they did turn it around to some extent, to a large extent. So anyway, I'm going off on a tangent. So, you know, we have the Biden administration come in. Oh, the policy doesn't really change. The genocide narrative doesn't really change. Um, and you note that even, and I've noticed this myself, even some of the anti-interventionist-ish people on mainstream media, you mentioned Tucker Carlson, which I had definitely noticed. Like he'll be going on, on a, on a a very what I think is a very reasonable narrative and then it'll just go into some I mean sometimes in the next sentence some weird China hawk narrative You're like what, what what just happened but you mentioned also that Bill, Ma Bill Maher and John Oliver also did that that I did not know they're like full-fledged China hawks well what I did in the article is I linked to the the, the specific and instances sorry there uh, I link to the specific instances where I'm talking about. So I don't know if they're going off on these, uh, you know, tirades on a regular basis. Uh, but at least as I was listening to things, you know, Tim Poole would talk about uh, Bill Maher's monologue about China. And mm -hmm. then I, I found another John Oliver clip when I was doing the research. So I, I link those. Okay. Yeah. I have to dig a little further into all the links. Um, There's a lot. <laughs> There's a lot. Of, I spent a lot of time researching this. Yeah, you did. It's clear that you did. And then you also start, then you start veering toward the more independent media 
also some some surprises in there for me because I'm not a regular consumer of uh, some of these and I definitely no longer watch Bill Maher or John Oliver. Um, but Joe, so you're saying Joe Rogan <laughs> gave, gave this narrative a platform, huh? There was, he, and this was a little bit ago. So Joe Rogan had uh, Ben Shapiro on and at least Ben and Joe were talking about it. And you know how Joe Rogan's opinions on things change depending on who he's talking to. So it's, it's really hard to pin him down on a certain position. And I don't think, I personally don't think he really has any principles. He just, maybe that's why he's so popular. The <laughs> big open-minded kind of guy thing. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and so he had Ben Shapiro on who was explicitly talking about it. And uh, admittedly, some of these others, you know, Steven Crowder was specifically talking about it. Dave Rubin had someone on who in that link, he dances around it and kind of points the finger at China of committing like human rights abuses. Uh, Reason Magazine was all in. Vice is all in. The Young Turks was all in. Democracy Now! was all in. Um, You know, and I linked to a Dave Rubin tweet where he talked about that town hall where Joe Biden was accusing or he basically poo-pooed the Chinese genocide issue. But in that tweet, Dave Rubin specifically said that he was excusing genocide. So I thought that was a tacit, you know, yeah, acceptance. Yeah. And that's, I think the thing, and I, I talked to Gareth about this a little bit. I mean, that's the thing I think that may me make people shy away from this topic because being called a genocide denier is one of the worst things you can be accused of. Right. So it's, it's, it's dangerous territory. Um, it should be just as dangerous territory to accuse someone falsely of genocide though. Right. right. I mean, in a fair world. Uh, so yeah, democracy now places demolished. I mean, I, I, nobody knows really what happened there or, or yeah. I haven't heard a good explanation there. I'm sure there's a good explanation in it. It has a lot of dollar signs uh, before it. Um, the Young Turks, we kind of know what happened there. 20 million investment and whatever. Vice. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Bye. Reason Magazine. That, that surprised me. You see, I specifically, you, have- um, you see, I specifically there, I wanted to point at some libertarian voices who have been uh, saying these things. Uh, specifically, and that was kind of the point too with calling out Tim Pool because, and I'm sure we'll get there, but Tim is probably the most egregious um, violator here. Yeah. But but Tim Pool, you know, he's been taking these libertarian bents lately, especially lately. I know he's he's kind of a moderate centrist, he says. But I, I wanted to touch on something that you had said earlier, though, before I forget that, of course. You know, the the mainstream media is dying. I I think we see this with CNN's ratings that they need Donald Trump because the ratings were so high and they've just been playing the coronavirus narrative so much uh, because it's, you know, they don't have Trump anymore. So, um, but one thing that I noticed that's more insidious in a way about the, uh, the independent media is because I don't know about you, Joanne, but when I listen to a podcast, I feel I really feel like I know the host. And I think that's because in a podcast, you have long form. It's a it's a long form uh, media. And so you listen to somebody for hours and hours and hours. And I have this experience when I get on with people doing interviews on my show is that I feel like I've known them for years, but they have no idea who I am. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, you do, you do develop some, some nice relationships and in conversations that go well. And most of them do, you know, it's a nice format, the, Mm -hmm. the long form and. But, but you trust someone so much because, you know, trust level. Yeah. You feel like you, you know them, you know about their personal life if they share some of it. So it's a, it's a real personal relation. It's a one way relationship, but it's very personal. Right. So you can see that that trust value, um, why it would be targeted. You know, having 
grown up on the left, if you will. I'm very used to co-option, anything good getting co-opted. Yeah. Uh, with very, very few exceptions. So it's just one of those things that's very sad. You know, it hurts. Um, but that's why, you know, you never... You try not to have any heroes, uh, you know, because everyone's vulnerable. But yeah, so so we we have this going on, and and I guess you could say like Reason Magazine, um, Mother Jones was an iconic left um, magazine. Well, that's totally taken over and just completely wrecked. Uh, so I guess we shouldn't be that surprised by democracy now, but it's still, you know, it's still hard. Um, so yeah, let's get into Tim Pool. You know, I have been watching him. I'm not a regular watcher now. In fact, I, I can't remember the last time I watched him, but I watched his live stream starting at Occupy Wall Street. So I was familiar with him right from the start he did an incredible job on that. Uh, he was for long periods of time live streaming. You have to remember this is in 2011 and people probably don't realize now, but live streaming was a brand new thing at that point. The, um, I'm trying to think, did he, he I, a lot of them used, there was a website called like stream.io. No, that, that's not, that's restream.io. There was another way that you did live streaming you actually had to use a particular website to do it was it like periscope i don't know if periscope existed then because twitter was brand new yeah i, I wasn't in the political space at that time <laughs> yeah no it was like um it was a particular website and then there was like there were like two different websites um how much youtube was going on then I guess it was around, but I, I don't know if they had live streaming yet. Maybe they did. But I remember watching his his live streams. Um, I, like I, I went up there. I'm not too far from New York. So I was there about five or six times, particularly in the early days. And then I was, uh, you know, really wanted to know what was going on as much as I could. So I would watch these live streams. And at the time you could tell that he wasn't exactly complete. He wasn't exactly aligned with the politically with the people who he was filming. And he made some comments here and there that was saying, no, I'm, I'm not. Um, and, 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 you know, I'm not a leftist, but he, he, yeah, he tried to say that he was in the center but he certainly didn't seem very right-wing either. Over time, when he would live stream some of the uh, Antifa versus Trump supporters things, I think he tended to stay, he would be among the crowd uh, on the Trump side. But he explained that by saying that that's where it was safer, that you know Antifa was unpredictable. Uh, they didn't like people filming them or taking it and they would attack him for it, things like so. Okay, I accepted that. So I always figured he was a little bit more on the right side, but I don't think he made a big political move until the, like a reveal almost, until the Trump years. Is that accurate? I, I think to a point it is, yeah, because at, at, at some point, Tim Pool decided that he was a Trump supporter. And I don't know if that was because he saw the alternative and, and didn't like it or didn't I, I don't know is that he thought opportunity. that opportunity well i mean I, I don't know if your audience knows stefan molyneux but i think that's what he saw <laughs> i know the name i think i've seen some videos but i don't really know anything about him. he's a he's a very reviled figure um but he, he used to be like a very pure libertarian anarchist and then he in 2016 he supported donald trump and that's when he really blew up and, and okay. so a lot of people have said, you know, he, that's what he, that what happened. There, there are a number of independent media people who became well-known because of either Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump. Yeah. Because people were just like, hell with this mainstream media and just, you know, went off to find other 
sources. So, yeah. So, I mean, there was a big audience there clearly uh, to be had. I think there are a number of people right now who would like to um, become a new, you know, would like to get that audience as well. I think some just for opportuni opportunistic reasons, but, you know, I think others for co-option, uh, you know. Well, I, I, I don't want to um, land yeah. base Tim Pool too much in some way because I have, I don't know the guy, I've never talked to him, but it, at the same time, Tim Pool's brand is honest, integrity, uh, journalistic ethics. He talks about it constantly and about, he talks about his own fallibility. Uh, but at the same time, when I was listening to him, I just, I didn't know anything much at all about this China narrative. I've, I'd heard that they were committing genocide against the Uyghurs, but I had a chance. I was listening to Tim Pool's daily show a lot, and I would notice that he mentioned the Chinese Uyghur situation and, and talked about China like two or three times a week. It was a lot. More than anything else? I, I wouldn't say more than anything else, like not as much as the culture war kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Mm -hmm. But certainly when it came to foreign policy, that was yeah. his biggest topic. Yeah. So I what I, I want to get your take on what uh, his segment titles here. <laughs> I don't... Yeah, I like I have those here. Um, the big sensational things with some all caps embedded in there. So China is colonizing the entire world, even as it extracts the U.S. Oh, wait, extracts the U.S.? Yeah, yeah. Um, this is how they win. China, all caps, weaponizes U.S. wokeness where they used to mock the white left. They know what they're doing. And then Joe Biden will sell the U.S. out to China on a silver platter if they ask for it. And then the Chinese Communist Party is profiting off of human rights abuses against minority groups. Well, colonizing the entire world, even as it, extra I don't understand what it extracts the U.S. means, but yeah, I don't, I don't see... China colonizing the entire world. Um, although, I mean, they are, they are now an industrial nation. They are an industrial power. Industrial powers need lots of resources and they're gonna be all over the world looking for them and getting them. And it's, so that part uh, doesn't shock me. Like how you go about getting them is, that's the, you know, the thing you gotta work watch out for they have a win-win strategy uh they do some bartering too you know where it will at least they made an offer like this to iraq you know uh, give us oil we'll give you we'll develop infrastructure for you um for iraq that's actually a good deal right because cash is a problem um oil is not particularly if if the chinese will help them you know facilitate that too so that seems reasonable, but I think that we, sh you know, that is something you should always watch out for. Uh, people going around the world uh, going for, for resources because look at the history. And I think a lot of people think along those lines. I think there's a lot of, I don't know what this is, what the psychological term for this is, but it's sort of like, it's a little bit like projection. Yeah. Whereas, um, we assume that they're going to do the same things that the Western civilizations did to exploit African countries for resources. Uh, terrible things, right? Now, China, China says that they have a win-win strategy, but of course they'll say they have a win-win strategy. I mean, and what we, then the whole IMF situation, you know, it, it could turn out that way where they lend a lot of money or they make a lot of contracts. And if the, uh, if the home country then finds that they can't repay the debts for all those train lines and infrastructure and you know, desperately needed things, what happens? Uh, do they then take ownership of 
key assets in that country like ports. I believe that is kind of already happening in Greece, although I'm not sure of the exact arrangement. But so I think that's a legitimate thing to worry about. Or, um, well, if you weren't worried about Western countries doing it, I don't know why you're suddenly worried about China doing it. So there's that. Yeah. But um, you know, I, don't, I don't necessarily buy the whole win-win and the benevolent power, the benevolent rising power thing, or at least I'm skeptical, right? Because if you have a big empire, a big empire with a big military um, that's starting to get a little hostile to you, although not its investors clearly, but you know, you're not going to, I don't think you're going to rise up in a belligerent way, right? You're going to do it in a very humble, more quiet way uh, until you get big enough. And then you're going to start being more belligerent. Maybe you're going to challenge the empire. China has, to their credit, for a long time, let's talk about something like the UN Security Council. They've complained about the, and, and the uh, global institutions. They've blamed that the table was, you know, not even, that it was a tilted table, that the, the people who made the rules made them in their own favor, um, which is entirely true. And, you know, they, so they say things like, we need a more uh, even application of international law. We need a more fair system. This is, this is not fair to us. So I, I'm of two minds about it. I, don't think it's wise. And there's a lot of independent media, particularly on the left, who defend China because of these, you know, accusations and the sensationalism and the danger of, of this building of a, another, a new big boogeyman. But sometimes I think they're maybe not skeptical enough or not realistic enough. I'm really looking for a, a middle ground. In fact, that's what I liked a lot about your talk with Kyle was that you know, you, there was no emotion in it. You're just trying to look at this in the most objective way possible without the crazy China hawk point of view and without the, um, I can't even think of a good nickname for this, but this sort of rose colored glasses uh, about China. Because I mean, if you look, there are some things there that do look pretty good, uh, particularly their infrastructure. It doesn't surprise me that they're offering that service to other countries because look, they're, look what they've done with their own country, at least from what we can see. And that's another one of my gripes is that I'm not quite sure that I do have a good view of what is really happening in China. Certainly in the cities, it, it looks pretty good. Um, so I'm not quite sure if I answered your question there, but that's, that's my, my take on it. Yeah. And I mean, another thing that I've noticed, you, you mentioned people on the left who perhaps are too rose colored when it comes to China, but what I've really noticed on the right and Tim, Tim kind of represents this, but at the same time, it's all this concern that China is covertly influencing our, our culture in a way that like, it, it's, it's very kind of neo McCarthyist in a certain way. And uh, I'll, I'll give the caveat that, you know, McCarthy wasn't 100% wrong, but what he really should have worried about was the fascist reaction of the United States regime in combating this, you know, McCarthyist threat. <laughs> so what, what do you make of that? Uh, well, you know, lately, there is so much hypocrisy, and I know listeners are going to be like here she goes again because i say this all the time i think we need a new word for the the kind of hypocrisy and lack of self-awareness that we see you think i would just kind of get used to it and brush it off but it just it, it digs you know every time it happens sometimes it's to such a level that um i get into that state of being not surprised because here here we go again but but still shocked that that this can happen so yeah i i, I don't have a good answer to that yeah well like at least for me i'm i'm much more worried like who who's a bigger threat to my daily life and my my liberty from my perspective 
Is it the Chinese government to, you know, I don't know how far away China is, six, 7,000 miles away from me. Um, or is it my own government who has locked everyone in their houses for the last year? Or, you know, has if they haven't overtly done it, they've at least influenced the culture in ways where they've encouraged that behavior. Um, so th that's kind of my standpoint is like, okay, well, you know, that I don't watch the NBA, but everyone's talking about how sports and NBA is kowtowing to, you know, Chinese markets or how Disney is or what yeah. have you. I don't care, frankly, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I'm not very worried about uh, Hollywood catering to a Chinese audience or, you know, making changes to the movies because the Chinese government objected to something. I'm more worried about their collaboration with the CIA and the right. Pentagon. Yeah, so I'm more worried about that and about the last time I was in a movie theater, which is quite a while ago. There was like, I think I, I guess that it was about a five minute military recruiting, uh, you know, video uh, that was, you know, embedded into the, you know, they have, they do the like 10, 15 minutes of movie previews. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. In that was this like five minute long military, very sophisticated, looked like a movie itself, um, military recruiting ad. And I'm a little more worried about that. Yeah. Yeah. And just as an aside, I mean, it seems like even, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I'm, I'm kind of a cynic, but film just has not been very good for maybe the last 10 years. I mean, even before that even, but it's like, even the United States propaganda films are, are crap now. It's like, you know, Mel Gibson's the Patriot probably radicalized so many kids who would have gone, who ended up going to Afghanistan and Iraq or, uh, we were soldiers or, you know, in a way, Black Hawk Down, uh, Saving Private Ryan, like all these films were like objectively in in a way I thought they were good films. But I don't know if you saw The Outpost, that that film about Afghanistan. And I didn't. It was awful. I mean, <laughs> just just crappy quality. In, yeah. In every way. Yeah. Yeah. In every way. Yeah. I don't I don't watch a lot of movies now either. Uh, it's yeah. just in even Netflix. Just it just seems more and more infused with, with propaganda and that kind of wrecks it for me. I guess I have a certain tolerance for it, but sometimes like it just completely ruins something. For example, the, um, the house of cards. So I'm a fan of some of the old British, uh, the BBC type uh, mysteries and, and, and things like that. So I did watch the original the original BBC, I think it was BBC, certainly a British um, movie or whatever they, whatever you call that. I guess it was a TV movie or something. And it was really good, you know? And uh, so when they made the American version of it, I was kind of excited to watch it. And in the beginning, it was pretty good. I don't even remember how many seasons are. They dragged it out so far, but at some point, when Obama was in office and Samantha Power actually bragged about this later in either the New York Times or in, a, in some type of big uh, article, magazine article spread, they just injected Putin into it, which had nothing to do with the original. They just totally veered off from the thing that they based it on. And they just infused it. I mean, they just injected all this Russiagate type, you know, propaganda. And I was shocked that they, that they did that. They took like a sort of a well-known, I don't know if you call it a masterpiece, but certainly a, you know, a well-done series and they, and they just, just totally ruined it. And I think that's part of the reason why things are so terrible. I've heard a lot about the TV series, I don't watch TV at all anymore now, that 24 thing, and I heard a lot of talk about that and how it started to become predictive and there was torture type things in it. And man, that's shocking to me. It's just really shocking. Um, in fact, it, it's so, sometimes these things are so 
so shocking that I find I find it hard to even I have to stop and think about it. I can't, it, I become speechless about it. So um, yeah, that's the kind of thing that worries me a little more than adapting things for Chinese audiences. Uh, not that I'm not worried at all about anything, but you know, that's a huge consumer base. Uh, they're growing in wealth, their middle class is growing. So there's all kinds of consu potential consumers just sitting there and there are a lot of companies who are just chomping at the bit to get to that audience who wouldn't. Um, so that part I'm not, I'm not quite so worried about. That is the up and coming um, source of lots of, lots of business. From, from my perspective, I, I think that at least people like Tim Pool, they fall victim to what I call the, the, uh, the fixed pie fallacy is this idea that Chinese prosperity must necessarily come at expense of our own prosperity. And, you know, I'm, I'm a free trader. So I, you know, economically speaking, a win-win transaction is beneficial for both sides by definition. And I, I don't see that, you know, why, why does Chinese prosperity have to come at the expense of our own? And if, if you get in that mindset, kind of that animalistic lizard brain mindset, you, you know, you fear the other and you fear the great red menace. And um, it, it's just all baloney. I mean, why can't we both why can't we both be prosperous? I just maybe that's naive of me, but that's what I think. I have no problem with why can't we both be prosperous, but I am a little more lizard brained on the how how it has evolved. And because I, well, there are a number of reasons why, but um, my original career is industrial engineer. So mm -hmm. manufacturing distribution. And as I was coming into the field, I, so I had sort of a closer view of things, you know, packing up shop and sending these operations over to whether they would just, you know, actually move the machines and the operation over to Ch not just China, other countries too, but to a large extent China, or they just decided instead of moder modernizing their factories, they just built the new ones overseas in the pursuit, the endless pursuit of cheap labor. Mm -hmm. And the with the hopes that China would then, they, keep, they always talk about opening up, opening up their economy, uh, their market, their consumers, to our companies. Well, they haven't opened up very, very much. That has not panned out very much at all. Although maybe very slowly it, uh, for some things it has. <clears throat> but what I saw was corporate, there was absolutely no consideration of how that would devastate an entire class of workers here. It was complete greed I saw it even more up close in the IT field when they started to, they realized they had a supply demand problem that they were going to need to pay, that IT workers were gonna become more and more in demand and more valuable. And instead of doing that, they started outsourcing um, things. They started uh, more H-1B visas, um, all kinds of things. and the big tech companies here over time formed a cartel among themselves and they basically put caps on salaries so that they, they interfered with the market in other words. Mm, yeah. So this is not free market, right? This is, and I guess I'm always worried that the constant pursuit of cheap labor with no consideration of the, the country where your roots are, where, you know, where you came up, no, no consideration at all for, the places geographically, the people. Um, and in the end, it, the endless pursuit of cheap labor is what? It's like slavery, right? They say automation, but you know, it, in the end, not wanting to pay, pay a fair price for labor. And so, you know, I see it that way too. And I see it as a conscious decision among executives in, in industry to do that. So, um, 
Well, and that, I, I that see, taints my view. Well, I see that is is being a real problem, you know, and I, I think it is a problem that, you know, we ignore at our peril. It's it's something that is causing suffering, you know, and yeah. and so it's something not to take lightly for sure. And we have a lot of people talking about you, you can see that Biden, for example, picked up on the Trump narrative because he could see. I don't know how he didn't notice this before, but he could see how important an issue that was to bring back manufacturing, whatever. I don't know whether you're ever going to bring back manufacturing, but certainly something can be done to address the issue of a just completely hollowed out, mostly center of the country, but not just the center. And there was also this myth, part of the sell for doing this was, well, we're now going to have a creative class. Um, oh, the good jobs are going to stay here. The engineering is going to stay here. The R&D is going to stay here. Well, guess what? No, <laughs> that's not happening. That is naturally going to move to be closer to the place where the things are manufactured. And you can see it happening. I can, I can cite a few examples of that. So, um, oh, anyway, I I'm off track a little bit. So, so Biden, you can see him now picking, trying to pick up the narrative, build back better, which also happens to be a Davos slogan. Yeah. But with that aside for a second, uh, but he's trying to pick up on that, that thing that Trump picked at, that thing that was being ignored by other politicians, things that they would rather, uh, a, a vet, you know, a, an avenue they would prefer that he had not taken, whether or not he really thought he really intended to or really thought he could bring back manufacturing, I don't know, but he talked about it and it certainly hit a nerve. Um, but just before that, in the Obama years, they mocked that stance and they took like, well, listen, we're the adults in the room and those jobs are not coming back. Uh, they didn't say like, you're, this is going to be a service economy and, you know, most of you are going to work for minimum wage with no real career path. Um, they talked about knowledge workers and the creative class and, and things like that, where um, that did happen to some extent, but it's, um, you know, there's the, there just not that many jobs in that, in that tranche of, uh, of workers in the country. So you can see that they they are running with that narrative. So they know it's important now. Um, I don't know whether they think like, you know, Trump let the cat out of the bag or whatever, but really it was something people in real life were talking about. It was just the politicians who were refusing to address that. And as far as I can see, they, other than basic, uh, basic income, whatever, Andrew Zhang, uh, Andrew. Oh, Yang, his Yang. Universal basic uh, income. Universal basic. You know, I haven't heard any other real plan for increasing the jobs. Oh, green. They say that the, the Green New Deal is going to create tons and tons of jobs. Maybe it will create some. I, I don't know. But um, so that's that's my my view on that. Um, but anyway, I, we really got off on a tangent just from that that headline of Tim Tim Pool's colonizing the entire world as it extracts the U.S. Right. Uh, the China weaponizing U.S. wokeness. I don't that I don't really get that. I haven't seen that happen, but maybe it's something I didn't pay attention to. But it's clear these are big sensational things. These are popular on YouTube. You notice that some people, if you look at their. Um, now the, the word is escaping me the you know the the front card on your on your uh, on oh, your the videos thumbnails? Hmm? the thumbnail yeah the thumbnail you know some people have the big neon letters and all that stuff and other other people don't because there's probably some technique that will get you more views if if you do that but. I don't remember him being this quite this sensational before. Of course, I first, you know, saw him as a live streamer where it was just something basic like uh, a date and a, and a topic or something. But yeah, this developed over time. And 
I, I don't know if you've, I, I mean, you, you said you don't watch him every day, but he, I, I've, since I discovered this about him, I've kind of stopped watching him so much because it's made me wonder what else yeah. he's subtly implanting. Um, almost every topic that he covers, he gets in a heated animated thing. Mm. And I don't always remember him doing that, but, it, and it's always, you know, whether it's about the Derek Chauvin trial that's happening right now, I'm just thinking of things he's talked about today at, or, or, and, and admittedly, he is good on some things. I mean, he's criticized Biden for reneging on the the Afghanistan withdrawal. Um, so it, it's kind of in a bit of a mixed bag. But I, I've tried to be and I appreciate that, you know, talking about the trying to be objective when it comes to this issue. Um, I'm just trying to avoid these pitfalls. It's like sleepwalking through a minefield in a way. <laughs> it is a minefield. Um So anyway, you, you, you sort of demonstrate what you're talking about pretty well using focusing in on Tim Pool, but noting that there are a lot of others doing the same kind of thing. Um, but he, oh, so he made this other claim. He said, the biggest threat the U.S. has ever faced is a rising and despotic authoritarian Chinese Communist Party. So I'm not too surprised to, to see that there are a large swath uh, of Americans who would uh, target the Chinese Communist Party. Also, I grew up in the end of the, I was coming of age in the late, in the latest, later Cold War era. So this doesn't surprise me, this communist stuff, right? This was way more uh, prevalent then, I would say, than it is now. On the other hand, <laughs> the left was a lot more, um, a lot went further left. There was more tolerance for even further left. I mean, there were communists in this country then. I guess there are now too, but I mean, I think we had a communist party in this country. I don't know. Um, so there was that too. But so that I guess that the communist. Chinese Communist Party stuff doesn't really shock me that much. Biggest threat we've ever faced. I don't know, maybe uh, if you're only looking at modern history, I mean, it's, it's certainly the biggest challenge to our prominence that that's for sure in the last say hundred years but uh, that's the big thing. Rising and despotic authoritarian. Authoritarian, I, I think that's pretty easy to argue that it's a pretty authoritarian government. Despotic though, I don't know. What's, what's the root of that? I guess the genocide, maybe that, maybe that's what allows you to use a term like that. Um, well, from what I can tell most Chinese citizens are members of the Chinese Communist Party. Is that true? They're card carrying members and at least tacitly they support the the regime. So I mean isn't it isn't it like a definition of despotism that it's against the will of the people? Yeah. I don't I'm even not know saying... exactly what a despot is, just somebody who does terrible things and is a, a tyrant. Um but no I think Xi uh, Xi Jinping is very popular the chinese uh, government themselves said that they have a very high approval rating which i pretty much believe but i have absolutely no way of knowing if that's true or not because they have such suppression of any criticism as far as i know um so there's that yeah i mean this is clearly really pumped up language and it's starting to it's starting to move toward the brutal dictator level, which you know, then the, the troops model. start getting deployed. Yeah, right. yeah. And I mean, my argument against him here is like, okay, well, I I personally think that the biggest threat the U.S. has ever faced is its own rising empire. You know, I mean, overextending itself in the Middle East and I, well across the world and our our bloated military budget and spending. So. I mean, I think that's a pretty easy argument for me to make. Yeah, and I would say that 
this was a self inflicted wound all the way, all the way down. Um, I'm not keen on sort of uh, living under a Chinese Communist Party empire if it, if it ever comes to that. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't prefer that way of life. I, I, I hear other people who say they lived there and it was great, much better than they ever expected. I believe, I don't think they're lying. Uh, it's just not really, I'm not a communist. Uh, we generally, people on the left are put into the box of all, we're all Marxists, mm -hmm. but I don't, I don't think that's necessarily true. I'm, I'm not a communist. I'm not even a socialist, although I prefer some social uh, programs. I, th I think we should definitely have some social programs, more of a new deal type arrangement. See, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not a person who like, I try not to assume ill will on behalf of other people. Like maybe this is, again, I'm saying this is naive of me, but I always assume that the person I'm talking to is coming from a place of compassion, you know, in general, like no one, I don't know, maybe you could say this about some right wingers, but no one wishes ill will on another group of people. I don't think maybe that's, maybe you do, do you agree with that? Is that most decent people want, you know, yeah. good people? Yeah, I think there's a lot of live and let live type attitude and as long as they're not harming um, people in any way. Uh, yeah, I think people are pretty tolerant, at least that's what I see in, in real life. Not mm -hmm. all people. I mean, you know, most people we're talking about most people. I can yeah, I agree with that. Quite a few glaring exceptions, you know, as I say that, but um, yeah, so. Yeah, so um, you start, this makes you curious when you see all these things, you're curious about a few things, like, is anything he's saying true? Is there any truth to this? Because, I mean, it could be, right? I'm open to, I don't, I don't really, I'm still a pretty open book on this. I, it's not something that would shock me so much that I couldn't believe it, um, but you know, I need, I need some evidence. There's these kind of, act, we, we've been to this rodeo before. We've seen this pattern before. Um, so not only do you start wondering, is any of it true, but you start wondering why is he, why is he doing this? And what's this pattern among people who's, who's behind it potentially, right? So, um, you go to Garrett's article, you know, you, and the gray zone, the work that the gray zone has done. You also tap into what Peter Lee has said about it. And he's, he's not a newcomer to the subject, like some, you know, some others are. He's been, he's lived in Asia. Uh, he's as a businessman there, and he has been writing about this stuff for a long time. Uh, I don't know how long I've been reading him probably going on 10 years now. I don't, I don't know how long he had the China Matters blog and now he has the, uh, the show on Patreon. Um, and then Gareth, Gareth's story got a lot of attention and they started digging into where this information came from, which I, I was pretty surprised at how thin this <laughs> yeah. was. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. For such a big, for just a such a such a big accusation against a big power that does have a voice, you know, uh, a growing voice in the media, I would say. And certainly, they our media companies, they're shareholders, right? So they're big investors in this country too. They own a lot of property, so it's not like they won't be able to do anything about it. But I thought the the Adrian Zen story was one of the most surprising things. But they just banked on the fact that people aren't going to go back and read the report that he is basing his things on. You know, I think they just rely a lot on the fact that, and I, I think from statistics, I don't know how they determine this, but they came up with some kind of a statistic, like 80% of people only read the headlines of articles, something like that. 
and you could cl you could see clearly there's a big uh, headline game going on. Uh, it's gotten so extreme now that sometimes the headline doesn't is not even supported by what's in the article itself. That's actually kind of common now. But so was that what it, what struck you as what were you surprised at when you dug into this? I, I think it was just like you said how thin it was how thin the support for all of this was and i you know i have to admit uh, gareth's article and the reporting at the gray zone was a big big foot in the door for me on this topic yeah, uh, yeah. pointed me in a lot of good directions and they've done awesome work on it I, I i think when i initially got into it i remember when i didn't know anything about the topic i saw those the pictures of the internment camps and you remember you know the pictures of all the the men in in blue on their knees and being addressed, you know, like, like a concentration camp in Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. And you, you would also mention Peter Lee. Uh, Peter Lee is actually the one who tempered cause I was more on the rose colored glasses side, but listening to Peter Lee and Gareth was on with Scott Horton at one point a, a month or two ago. And he's like, yeah, there is human rights, you know, issues going on here. <laughs> And I, I'm really grateful for that. But, you know, as I got into the gray zones reporting, um, it, it wasn't just Adrian Zenz as much as um, I think it's surprising to me the amount of people that cite Adrian Zenz's work as if it's fact. Um, so there's that, but there's also the whole Falun Gong angle. And that yeah, was also yeah. written about in. Can the you go into that a little bit some more? Yeah. So. Um, Tim Pool had China Uncensored on his, uh, his daily show and he had them on twice, once in December of 2020 and another time last month. And I was suspicious because these members of China Uncensored were talking about organ harvesting. They were talking about uh, systematic rape. They were talking about the worst allegations that you could possibly uh, level at someone. And in digging into this, I discovered that the China Uncensored program are practitioners of Falun Gong, which is a spiritualist movement that started in uh, China in the 90s by this man, Li Hongzi. And um, it, it was kind of a hybrid. I don't want to say new age because that's more of a Western thing, I feel, but it was a hybrid of, of Taoism and uh, another another. Eastern religion. And it was, it included meditation and it's been alleged that Falun Gong is a cult. Now I'm not going to go that far, but uh, they do have some out there beliefs. One is that they can heal themselves with their mind through meditation, which isn't quite as far out there considering all the movements in the world. But um, Li Hongzi has said things that he can levitate, that practitioners can levitate that aliens have invaded the human mind and humanity. And he said that he can walk through walls. So I've linked to those articles too. But the story of Falun Gong is that they were persecuted by China. Um, there's allegations that some of them were disappeared. But in the 90s, Li Hongzi and his followers fled to the United States. Li, he emigrated to New York City. They the practitioners actually started the Epic times, which really blasted off with the Trump campaign. So uh, some yeah. people, you know, it, it became a Trump outlet in a way. Um, his practitioners also started a broadcasting company called new Tang dynasty. And so it's been proven through a video that uh, Nathan rich, he's a YouTuber. Uh, I don't know if he was born in China, but he knows he he covers a lot of China issues. Yeah, that name, yeah. I, I don't know if you know him. Um, I'd like to talk to him actually about this, but he he did an expose on China Uncensored specifically, and he went through and proved, I would say beyond a reasonable doubt, that uh, China Uncensored is Falun Gong, that they are a subsidiary of New Tang Dynasty, and that their their members are. Uh, excuse me, the broadcasting crew are all, are all practitioners of Falun Gong. And Falun Gong has always been behind the organ harvesting narrative as far back as it goes. 
So one another thing that I, I uh, cite in the article here is a transcript of Li Hong Z in 2009 going to the Epic Times and New Tang Dynasty Studios and addressing um, all of them. And there's a transcript of the speech talking about how they are Falun Gong, how uh, their mission is to become regular media and to expose the evils of the Chinese government. And all that aside, um, you know, I don't want to character assassinate them or say that they're crazy. Therefore their allegations are, you know, not credible, but you know what their narrative, you know, you know what their motivations are. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's not just like reporting the news or being media. It's, it's with a target. Does that, doesn't that seem kind of similar to the, uh, the situation in Iran now the the name of that group is going to escape me for a minute I'm a little dull it's getting later at night yeah. um but but there's another group similar to that a, a cultish kind of group um oh man I can't believe I can't think of the name but but the another parallel that I see that they they're very um they seem to be very focused on visuals and they have beautiful um, setups for their stage and the, uh, their clothing is it's beautiful silk uh, type things. And I, ha I don't know that much about Falun Gong, but I did see some of their, they have like a video channel, I think, and like big productions are, are their thing. Aren't they the ones who do these huge dance stage productions with the bright gorgeous colors and dance you know fabulous dancers and are they in upstate new york is that where they are now yep that would be them and they they do have a compound now i'm not going to say that makes them a cult but they do have a large compound um yeah and they do have a dance troupe where they These big stage productions right yep. oh i see so they, so they travel the and do shows in different places is that is that how it works I, I think so, you mm -hmm. know, but then again, remember when Angela Merkel and I don't know if it was s some elitist organization, they had that big stage production that looked like some satanic ritual with the opening of like a big railroad. It was an underground. It was something in Switzerland. I didn't see that. <laughs> no. So, I mean, I was going to say that, you know, we're talking about follow Gong and the dance troops, but then again, Angela Merkel and, and these elites have their own big stage productions too. Yeah. So. The culture thing. Yeah. Mm. Right. So, so, so anyway, but that's where, that's where these guests came from, from, from Tim. Yeah. Yes. Yep. And, and he had them on twice for each seg. I think each time they were on, they went for two or two and a half hours. And, and in, in your article, you say after a while, it became impossible to answer the question of why didn't he bring it up? Why, why did he not, you know, if he's such a truth teller and why did this never even come up? Or even in just, you know, if you provide a bio for, for your guests, why don't you mention that? Why was it omitted from the conversation? Yeah. And, and one of the Chris, uh, Chris Chappell, he's the main host of China Uncensored. He even mentioned, he accused, you know, the Chinese government of organ harvesting. And he specifically mentioned Falun Gong and how they had been persecuted and disappeared. And I did not know why Tim would not ask a few follow-up questions to that. Mm. Um, you know, and like I said earlier in this episode, I don't want to assume ill intent. Uh, but at some point, the, the, the simplest explanation became something like, okay, well, how, you know, how could Tim fail to look into this? Just today or yesterday, he was talking about how he fact checks, how he fact checks everything that he mentions on the show. Uh, yeah. And, and so, I mean, so at, at some point, yeah, it, I, if you're sitting there, you have hours to talk to these people and Luke Rudkowski is another um, member of the independent media who during the change. Time, that guy? Yeah. Yeah. Luke from, we are change. Yeah. And you know, Luke is a, he is a libertarian. I mean, he's a very, he's a libertarian anarchist. He's in our circles and he on his shows was pushing this new lines report which I'm sure we could get into, uh, which was the first independent, you know, think tank report uh, officially declaring that the Chinese government was running afoul of the genocide convention of 
1948. Yeah, I don't think we went into the specifics of that in, in the other interviews we did here. If you wouldn't mind, I'd love to hear more about it. Oh, yeah, yeah. So uh, all of a sudden, I, I think it was last month in, in March. So this is a new uh, report. The New Lines Institute came out with what was being heralded across the mainstream as being this definitive independent report saying that the Chinese government is um, committing genocide against the Uyghurs. Uh, it went through, of course, it heavily featured Adrian Zenz's work, but it also featured a lot of eyewitness testimony. Yeah, this was this is what really caught my my view. And um, people people take eyewitness testimony to be very credible, particularly if there's video. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And and one big thing, you know, I I am an attorney. I, I mentioned that earlier in the show, um, but you learn in law school, especially. I did a store or I did a semester studying uh, the Innocence Project, and the director of the Minnesota Innocence Project was our professor, and so we learned extensively about how unreliable eyewitness testimony is, especially with identification um, mm. of of um, perpetrators. But the jury finds it to be incredibly convincing. So the New Lines Institute used a lot of eyewitness testimony in their reports. Uh, they cited, and I, this is where I came across the Uyghur, uh, the, excuse me, the Xinjiang Victims Project uh, database. And essentially through there, there's, I got into a Twitter exchange with, uh, I think it was Gene Boonin, uh, who was the who founded the uh, Xinjiang Victim Database. So we kind of chatted back and forth, but in, in the FAQ section of this website, which was heavily cited in the New Lines report, he talks about how um, we don't, in the FAQ section, he says, we don't fact check these. We don't fact check these witness testimonies uh, because it'd be impossible to do so. This is not to be taken as cold, hard facts. We tried to grade them on a level of reliability. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we believe the cumulative testimony speaks mm. for, for itself. Um, so the New Lines report uh, talks about that a lot, cites heavily. Uh, but I think the most damning was the source of this report. And the the gray zone went through and did a lot of the you know the the labor on this so i i kind of relayed it but essentially the fairfax university of america is a university that sponsors the new lines institute and sponsored this paper and that's not fairfax university in connecticut that's it's a whole different thing right yeah yeah mm -hmm. i think it's in dc Fairfax yeah. University of America. So it's essentially the gray zone. And I, I linked to an inside higher education article. Um, it is a Virginia university. Yeah, but it's, so a, it's not the Fairfax, Connecticut, which is a fairly, you know, um, yeah. I don't know I don't if you call it an elite institution, but, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a fairly, I don't know. Well, on a level, Joanne, you would think that a New Lines Institute report that's being heralded by, you know, the mainstream media would come from some kind of prestigious university, <laughs> but but it's not. This is a for-profit college that has maybe 30 or 40 undergraduate students that a few days before the New Lines uh, report came out, it actually, uh, the, the Department of Education recommended that its credentials be pulled. So... Um, it's astonishing, really. I mean, it's just it, it will boggle your mind. And of course, I, I ran um, I ran the list past Scott Horton of of the contributors, and I mean, it's it's neoconservatives. Mm. Uh, it's it's you know neoconservatives and neoliberal warhawks basically behind this report. You know, and they they try to say that they don't advocate intervention or anything like that, but it's it's like I don't know, carrying all the water for it. Yeah, they're just laying the groundwork, really. This it seems to be. Plus, I mean, I couldn't help wondering. They say that uh, so in 2018 and 19, Gulash, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, and other members of Atajurt, is that how you pronounce that? I, I believe so. Atajurt traveled across Xinjiang convincing 
unsophisticated Uyghur farmers to speak up about their detained relatives in Xinjiang. They arranged interviews with international media, held people petitions um, to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and helped people record thousands of video appeals, which they all made public on their YouTube channel. So, I mean, I couldn't help but sort of think, what if you took an, an organization like this and just let them travel across the American Midwest, let's say, any, any part of the country really, but let's just say some of the harder hit areas or really it doesn't really matter what, what part of the country, but um, don't you think you could find lots of people who would make pretty convincing videos critical of their government or the, I guess they were, they were giving actual details about these detention things though, I guess that's where it's different, but, um, I, I think, um, from the videos that I've seen, it seems to be generally people, a lot of them come from America. Some of the videos come from America, um, are so people they're exiles. Talking. In a way, or it's like second generation people, you know, Uyghurs okay. talking about their uncle at home or uh, essentially what it is, is like, oh, my uncle was accused of uh, terrorism and then he disappeared and we haven't heard from him in six months or something like that. Um, but to, to your point, though, Joanne, I, th I think that, you know, if we gave a camera, to, you know, and took <laughs> interviews from people around the country, I I'm sure that you could find um you could find a lot of people talking about how, you know, their, their brother was falsely accused of some crime and is in prison in the United States and he's sentenced to 60 years to life or, you know, a situation where um, my, I don't know, my aunt had a husband who was involved in the mob and she answered the phone one time and she ended up in prison for 60 years, you know, cause they used her, you know? So I guess yeah. the point I'm trying to make is that like, the explanation of what this really could be um, is probably just as bad as what we have in the United States right now with imprisoning people. Yeah. And I mean, to be fair, this is the kind of information we have from Yemen, from Afghanistan. I think there, there have been sort of similar projects like this. So, and those are those reliable because I I'm relying on you here. I'm trying to remember now. I remember when Medea Benjamin went over to Afghanistan. I bring it up, but I only have a, a vague memory of what they actually did. Um, but I've also seen reports compiled because, for example, when they're trying to figure out casualties of civilians, our military doesn't collect that information. So they they basically have to consult with villages, with doctors, with facilities, and they have to sort of cobble this information together. And that's all witness type information too. Not all of it, but at least some of it of what happened to their families and, and this kind of thing. So there, there is that. The stories about attacks in Yemen, um, the things that Jeremy Scahill wrote about, I believe those are all based on the word of the people from there. So I'm not, I'm not comfortable just disregarding this information either. Yeah. And I, I think that's a very fair point. And I, you know, after I wrote this article, I was trying to circle the square in my own mind and be like, okay, you know, on the one hand, I'm casting doubt on the Uyghur genocide narrative, but on the other hand, I'm de I'm very definite about what's happening in Yemen and condemning that. Um, you know, on the one hand, we have a little more influence on on that, um, even if that influence is small. But I, I don't want to condemn it. But one thing I will point to, um, like, right, I don't want to dismiss it outright. But one thing I will point to is the fact that we can demonstrate uh, links to the U.S. State Department and these organizations that are procuring the testimony. Yeah. And, 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 and we've seen regime change operations in other countries. And, we, and we've seen how these kinds of things are manipulated. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult. It's, it's, it's very difficult to try to sort out, to make, uh, to do good analysis, or even to just come to some kind of a position for yourself. Um, 
I understand your skepticism and uh, I don't know, I guess we just have to do what we're, what we're doing is. Yeah. Try and find the truth. Yeah. And, and, you know, of course we're not perfect. I'm not perfect. And um, this is, this is a journey. It really is, but trying to seek that truth and, and trying to, you know, find good in the world <laughs> or prevent evil, I suppose. Yeah. To just try to, to do the best you can to do the right thing, uh, which you would think is sort of simple, straight path, but no, it's, it's, it's not always. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing is that we've heard a number of people talk about, and I have heard it framed the way that you, um, you mention it in here too, that one of the reasons that why, why we are in Afghanistan is to establish bases for uh, an operation in Xinjiang to create an insurgency inside China, whether it be for, and these are not short-term projects, right? You don't just go in in a few weeks. Like these are the long game in a lot of these things. It's, it's almost kind of more scary to me than, than anything else, sort of how long steadily the plot along and create the situation uh, so we you know we've heard from a number of people who we tend to trust that this kind of operation is happening i take it for granted as being true um and you know we know that this this region they you know they really don't want to be fully integrated into china oh. how they feel about it now but at least they certainly they want some kind of autonomy um they don't want to necessarily comply so it's a it's a prime target for for that kind of a thing but you mentioned some more you sort of pulled some of those details together about that operation maybe you want to talk about that a little bit yeah and i i wanted to be very careful not to misrepresent what uh colonel larry wilkerson is saying mm -hmm. uh and and this stems from a I believe it was a 2018 speech that he gave at the Ron Paul Institute, where basically the theme of the 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 evening or the uh, the event at he, that he was speaking at was that the U.S. Empire has no strategy, and what he was kind of saying is, well, yeah, we really don't have a coherent strategy in Afghanistan. Um, I don't advocate this line of of strategy. But what I think a coherent strategy would look like is this, even though I don't advocate for it. And the, the three, it had three prongs is what he said would be coherent. And one is to have military power in Afghanistan, which is one of the most inaccessible areas of the world. It also happens to be very close to the uh, Chinese land-based Belt and Road Initiative, which is you know, another theme that came up in our discussion here. Um, another one would be close to would be another prong would be to be close to Pakistan, which is one of the uh, the world's most unstable nuclear arsenals. And the third prong, again, it would be what you just mentioned, which would be uh, being able to go into uh, the Xinjiang province and with um, CIA forces to destabilize the region were a hot war to break out with China. And the military cover would be there in Afghanistan to provide uh, logistical support to that operation. So again, this is not what Colonel Wilkerson is saying that he would advocate, but he's saying, you know, in the event that we had a coherent strategy, it might look like that. Um, fast forward to two weeks ago, uh, Scott Horton interviewed Colonel Wilkerson again and revisited this topic. And, and that is where Colonel Wilkerson is saying that he's heard through the grapevine from very credible sources, unnamed, um, but you know I can understand in his position, but that the Chinese Uyghurs who went to uh, Syria to fight with NATO and and Turkey and Al Qaeda forces, um, that they returned back to Afghanistan or they are in the process of returning back to Afghanistan, and he said pretty ominously that they're not there to bake cake. So um, it, it's just interesting, you know, all these stories coming out of the area in, in light of, of, of that knowledge. Right. 
this is another thing that Peter Lee has been writing about for, well, he's been writing more about the Uyghurs coming in through Turkey, facilitated by Turkey, um, given passports, because it's not that easy to, you know, I don't think they can just hop on a plane and, and go to Turkey. So, but anyway, they facilitated that. And then I think there've been, tra you know, training camps and things and they put it on Turkey, but they're, there's a lot of U.S. and other Western intelligence operating inside Turkey, where that's their base, some of their bases of operations and things like that. And then they got sent in as a, part of the moderate rebel <laughs> program. But I, I believe they were, some people said that they are, they were some of the strongest, you know, fighters, some of the fiercest fighters and that kind of thing. But what I've also heard I'm not going to be able to cite sources right now. I just know that I heard it and found it credible. Maybe it was Peter Lee. Um, that this is something that concerned China a lot from, from the start and that they uh, were keeping an eye on this. You know, China is friendly and allied with Syria. I believe I read that they even offered to deploy some Chinese military, whether that would have been covert or overt, I'm not quite sure, but it was to basically either keep an eye on these Uyghurs or, you know, knock them off. I'm not quite sure. But what they're worried about is battle-hardened, trained jihadis coming back to China and causing trouble at home, obviously. So it's sort of an open secret that, that, that this is going on, although the Afghanistan part, I don't think that's as well known. But I also remember an interview with Scott. It was not Wilkerson. I want to say it was Begovich, but I think I may have gotten this wrong before and, uh, and had to correct, <laughs> correct <laughs> it in the show notes. But they actually, um, toward the end of one of an interview that I heard with Scott and with a, a fairly prominent person, this person was saying that they actually did think we needed to maintain a presence in Afghanistan to sort of just, uh, you know, have a little foothold there. And um, I'm not going to go any further because I'm afraid I'm going to mis misstate something. But they basically thought that it was, this was a person who was a definitely a foreign policy realist, but they thought that it was justified to to run an operation like this. So I, I remember, I I remember it being I'm, someone who I, I found to be credible. So I keep coming back to when I try and think about what the grand strategy is, I keep thinking of Zvignu Brzezinski talking about mm -hmm. the, you know, the world island um, and the grand chessboard kind of idea. Yeah. And, and so that's why I think that Afghanistan is so crucial or at least, you know, and, you know, things are flaring up in Ukraine too, which I, I'd love to talk about, but I, I think it's getting a little late. Um, but that's what I think, you know, that whole um, Eastern Europe kind of Western Asia area is so important. Yeah. I mean, I believe that it's important if you look at a map and you join Europe and Asia, you can, you know, you can certainly see why and if we just add up the number of population on those continents, you can see why people are worried. And of course, then we have the, you know, the exceptionalism and just the ego uh, of an empire, the kind of things they're worried about is someone potentially um, being able to challenge them. You know, no empire wants to be challenged and that really kind of twisted mindset sets in. But I don't know about that whole world island thing. I think it makes for an important, a certainly an important uh, strategic area. But you're kind of leaving out North America, South America, Africa. It's not part of the world island. I mean, it's not a little bit. Uh, I don't know. I do know that one of the things that you know military strategists always feared was an alliance between Germany and Russia, they never, you know, they felt that was something they could not easily uh, dominate. And certainly an alliance between Russia and China, uh, you know, that's, 
and that is happening. Although you have to wonder why, why did you overthrow the government in Ukraine and provoke Russia and constantly drive them away from the West, ridicule them, sanction them, this and that, um, I guess to prevent the Germany Russia alliance, I don't quite know, but why did you push them away so hard and then just constantly harass, cause trouble for them, and then get upset when they formed an alliance with China? Like, does that make any sense to you? I, no. I, <laughs> no. So if you didn't want that to happen, why did you keep doing the things that it would that was facilitating it? I, I guess I wonder. I, I think they're a lot dumber than we give them credit for. Um, you know, they they sound smart and they write in their in the CFR and all their papers and everything like that. But um, I think, you know, ultimately they're trying to centrally plan something that can't be centrally planned. Yeah, I tend right? to agree with you. Maybe maybe that. it's not quite that they're dumb, but it's just they're they're trying to undertake an impossible task. That's kind of my only hope at this point with some yeah. of the things that are going on is that there's just, it's, it just doesn't um, jive with nature. You know, it, it doesn't yeah. jive with human nature and, unless and you're, you're going to talk about trying to change that too, but that's a whole nother conversation. Yeah. Well, I, I think we could make a lot of hay there, but um, I, when you were talking about Zvignu Brzezinski and why it doesn't make sense I, I think that maybe he already accounted that Africa and South America was in the bag is that we already have that, you know, let's, oh. let's move on now to that. That's just my thought. I, I don't know. No, but when the original theory was formed, maybe it was, I guess it was actually. Oh yeah. I could see it's that. It's like a hundred years ago, right? Yeah. Well, maybe not that long. I have to brush maybe it. It was World that. War II era. Yeah. I don't remember when the original McKinder thing happened uh, maybe i'll i'll just look it up real quick i tend to think it was quite a while ago uh let's see world island kinder oh it's m-a-k okay Also, interestingly, Brzezinski's last article, the last thing that he wrote, sort of walked a lot of those things back. Oh, was really? Like, well, maybe that, maybe this empire thing isn't such a great idea. <laughs> and then he started talking about like a, a triangular arrangement where basically saying, sh like, should you, uh, cultivate the relationship with Russia against China or cultivate the relationship with China against Russia. But whatever you do, don't let the two of them get together when he played a big role in actually making that happen, which is um, Harold McKinder, 1861. So yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. He died in 1947. So probably, okay. probably in the, the range of, of around a hundred years ago. Well, talk. So you mentioned this and I should probably get going here, but you, you mentioned this about the CF or um, I mentioned the CFR, but you were talking about this triangular arrangement. Yeah. My, my next piece I'm starting to write for the Libertarian Institute has to deal with the CFR just came out with the paper talking about the Ukraine Russia situation uh -huh. and they frame it in this idea of a renewed great power competition where basically they're declaring the new cold war that's already started um, but they're talking about, it, it's pretty salacious. I mean, they're talking about how the United States needs to pull troops from across the empire and, and put them on the border with Russia and China and how we need to be preparing for like sustained war with Russia and China. And so I, knowing how kind of influential the CFR is, I just wanted to see what they're writing about the situation and said, uh, shed some light on it, but it, it was pretty, I, I posted I, a screenshot um, on my Twitter account yesterday or the day before that was a screenshot of what I was seeing. And I mean, it's chilling. Well, when you write that article, come back and do another swap cast. Let's talk about it. How's yeah, that sound? For sure. Definitely. <laughs> All right. So we should probably wrap it up since we're getting pretty late here. 
Um, but it was great talking with you and I look forward to doing it again. Yeah, for sure. And Joanne, since I'm going to put this on my feed too, do you want to tell the listeners you know, oh, sure. you yeah, sure. yourself briefly should, and where they can find your work? We should both do that. Yeah. Well, the easiest way to just go to aroundtheempire.com. Uh, but if you, you know, it's on all the mobile podcast apps, just look for Around the Empire. But if you have any doubt, it's on Twitter at Around the Empire. It's on a website, aroundtheempire.com. You can find it on Rockfin, on Patreon, on YouTube, and I'm expanding. I should be on um, Odyssey pretty soon. And I'm looking into some other ones as well. Awesome. Yeah. So everyone should go check that out uh, for my listeners too. But uh, for your listeners, Joanne, um, again, my name is Patrick McFarlane. I'm a practicing attorney in Wisconsin. My website is libertyweekly.net. Uh, you can find me pretty much everywhere. Just search Liberty Weekly and I'll be there. Excellent. Okay. Well, thanks for doing our first Swapcast and I hope to do it again and maybe it'll be on the world island and the latest crazy plan from the council on foreign relations for God sure help us all <laughs> yeah, right <laughs> yeah all right take care you too see you later bye thanks for listening special thanks to patrick mcfarland follow him on twitter at liberty underscore weekly subscribe to his podcast liberty weekly and find his work at libertyweekly.net and also at the Libertarian Institute. This podcast is independent media, listener support really important. Rockfin.com slash around the empire, patreon.com slash around the empire, paypal.me slash around the empire pod. You can find it on any mobile podcast app, on several platforms, Rockfin, Patreon, YouTube, and more coming. Or you can find everything on the website, aroundtheempire.com. Follow on Twitter, at Around the Empire, and we'll see you next time. Take care, everybody.